Marhaban wa ahlan bukum fi barnamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum Robert Zatloff. Lau kanat indikhabatna el riyasiya sabakan lil khiyul. Lakinna fi akhir munhaniyat el halaba mutajahin nahu el jawla el nihaiya min as Bad badat asabia tafawak khalalha al marashihun al mutamaradun. Alla el Morashahin el Mutakadamin, Badaat Malamuch el Saha Tatadach el Lil Ayan. La Awal Mara fil Tarikh el Hadith, Morashahan Riasian, Min Wilayat, New York. Wazirat el Kharajia Sabaka, Hillary Clinton, Wa Rajal el Amal el Milliader, Donald Trump. Min el Mutawaka'a, Anya Fuza, Betarshik, his Behema. Walakin el asabia el akhira min el hamla el tamhidia la zalat yumkin an tusfir an mufajaat hel ya fuz kalahma bi muadham aswat el mandubin wa yadhban illa mutamaratuma el hizbia el kamia kamarashihin hel yushkan al zalak walakin la yuhasalan al akhlabia Ma yatni anahu sayata ayan alayhima is dhab bad al mandubin fi Philadelphia wa Cleveland. Wa mada yafal al marashihun al akhirun. You had a boon hata akhir yom am you kararun an yakhruju min as sabak kharujan musharafan. La yasadu his behim fi November. La munakashat al sabia al akhira Min Hamla el Intechabat el Tamhidia. Yasurni and Urahib, Bilajna el Leti Tadam, Chabirena el Siasien, Norman Ornstein, was Steve Clement. Welcome back to Dachel, Washington. Today we're talking about the home stretch of our primary election season with our panel of political experts, Steve Clemens, Norm Ornstein. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Always a pleasure. So uh, let's focus first on the Democrats. Norm, are we in the home stretch? Does Hillary Clinton win a majority of delegates before the party meets in Philadelphia this summer? There's no question that Hillary Clinton will have a majority of the delegates before the party meets. With one little caveat, there are two kinds of delegates. There are the ones selected in the primaries and caucuses. We call them the pledge delegates. There are these so-called super delegates. These are automatic delegates who are elected officials, party officials. There's some controversy about them. They make up about 15% of the total. Hillary Clinton has the overwhelming majority of those. When we get to June the 7th, the final primary day, she's going to have a wide lead in delegates, but she might not have an absolute majority just from the pledge delegates. She'll need the super delegates to put her over. And she'll have those, but that's going to create, at least for some of the Sanders people, the notion that it took these party hacks to put her over the top. The real question, uh, Rob, over the next several weeks is whether Bernie Sanders uh, understands the reality that there is no way he wins this nomination and begins to transition towards a signal to his ardent supporters who have been really whipped up into an anti-Hillary frenzy that it's time to ratchet that down the bigger danger is the Republicans. So what do you think about this, Steve? Do you think Bernie Sanders begins to transition into the, the gracious loser, or does he fight to the very end? I think he's going to fight to the very end because it's very clear now that to him that he can't win. So what is he fighting for? He should have already begun that transition, and he isn't. And I think right now, uh, if, if in fact there's rationality at the core of that, that campaign, they're going to be fighting for policy positions. They're going to be fighting for their people in her cabinet. You remember when Barack Obama came in, the frame at that time was a lot of people trying to get into government to work for the Obama administration said, you know, if they, you know, supported Obama, they, they got a president. If they supported Hillary, they got a job. And so now I think there's going to be an interesting thing where is Bernie Sanders going to be able to pay, place his people in key positions, particularly key economic positions that demonstrate that she gets the message that that the uh, those that feel inequality is the big issue of the day uh, and that he's hammered at home home on are, are going to be there so he's fighting now for a greater cause than just winning the nomination so is there is there one or two things specifically he wants 
in Philadelphia, uh, in the, the platform or uh, in, in the convention more generally? You know, the, the bargaining that he'll be able to do with 40 to 45 percent of the delegates and an ardent uh, following starts with uh, a speaking role in prime time that really gives him the leverage uh, to get his message across. I think what Hillary Clinton will want in return for that is that his speech will also be a full-throated uh, explanation of why he's going to work night and day to elect her as president. Second is the platform, which is more symbolic than real. And if what he wants is some of his most ardent policies, which include uh, a single-payer uh, system, uh, return to Glass-Steagall, a law that uh, really separates the banks from uh, uh, different kinds of investments, uh, a pledge to break up all the big banks. He's not going to get those, but he could get some concessions. And I think Steve is right on a third point, which is assuming she gets elected president, he wants to be sure that there are people who will pursue policies that are not going to be hedged uh, the way that she might do it. Finally, there's a running mate and a question not of Bernie being a running mate, but of whether uh, uh, her vice presidential nominee is going to be received with some enthusiasm by those populist supporters of his. Elizabeth Warren being, you know, one of the, the, the foremost. Many people don't think Elizabeth Warren would sign on to a ticket with, with Hillary Clinton. I don't buy that. People always uh, look reluctant until asked. But uh, if Elizabeth Warren were to join that ticket, it would be a game changer for both the Bernie campaign, his enthusiasm, it would really unite a, a very deeply divided uh, caucus right now. But the, the, choosing the senator from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, the other leading progressive in America, would say a, uh, would, would would send a real message about Hillary Clinton turning left before the election. Is that is that the message that between now and November you think that Hillary Clinton wants to be sending to the general public? I think that. <coughs> one would think that she would try to find middle earth, but inequality and the questions of how to get a healthier social contract is something that I think appeals to those vast number of independents that they're going to have to bring in to support in a general uh, election campaign. So if you fashion it right, Elizabeth Warren may be offensive to some of them. Uh, there may be others. Uh, Jeff Merkley is very left. He came out in support of uh, Bernie Sanders first uh, in the U.S. Senate. There may be other candidates that fit that bill. But I think addressing the inequality issue in part by bringing in the right running mate, as Norm just said, is, is a way to do this. But I'll tell you, they're trying to fashion, at least in the primary season, I was with uh, Hillary Clinton in the room in New York the other night uh, after her New York primary win, uh, and Bill de Blasio and Governor Cuomo so and the mayor of New York, the mayor of New York came out and, and said, and I tweeted it, uh, said there has never been a more progressive candidate than Hillary Clinton in the last half century. Uh, and I ask whether the Washington Post fact checker was going to go check on that. But nonetheless, there is a crafting of her, a kind of positioning of her right now, very, very much left of where she has traditionally been. And I don't think she's going to want to abandon that because she's worked so hard to sort of look softer uh, or look more liberal on some of these issues um, than, than she has previously. I'm uh, skeptical about Elizabeth Warren. Uh, two women on the ticket, I think, is a, a bridge too far. And okay. Elizabeth is a flashpoint. But there are others. Uh, I think if you were looking for the ideal running mate from the Sanders perspective and from Hillary's, if you're going to have that kind of a marriage, it would be Sherrod Brown, the yes. senator from Ohio, who was a populist before it was popular. Ohio, a swing state, he's popular there. Uh, very attractive and articulate, uh, wife who won a Pul Pulitzer Prize for commentary, very uh, good as well. But there's a kicker. There's a Republican governor, John Kasich, in Ohio. If they won the White House, that Senate seat becomes vacant. A Republican would pick a Republican for the Senate. And remember, the Senate is up for grabs this time. Uh, Republicans have a four-seat margin, but there are 24 Republican seats up to only 10 for the Democrats. Many of them, including one in Ohio now, Rob Portman's seat, very vulnerable. Democrats, if they win the White House, could well win the Senate, but it might be by one or mm. two votes, and giving up that seat is a, uh, a risk. So Jeff Merkley of Oregon is really interesting. Uh, Steve mentioned him. He uh, endorsed Sanders, but didn't do so by blasting Clinton. 
Uh, just to pick another example, there's a very attractive and popular congresswoman from Hawaii, uh, a war veteran, Tulsi Gabbard, who endorsed Sanders and just blasted Clinton. Uh, Merkley I, may have positioned himself very strategically. Uh, he will be acceptable to the Sanders camp because he was an endorsee and he's more of a populist, not a threatening kind of guy, uh, but uh, somebody who you know, would be acceptable to Clinton. But she's got a lot of other options and uh, her options, uh, depending on how hard Sanders pushes, how much he goes over the line if he attacks her uh, integrity heading towards the campaign, she may very well decide that she doesn't need to make that concession and she can go for somebody she would want. That, I believe, would be Tim Kaine, the former governor, current senator from Virginia, wildly popular with his own colleagues as an extraordinarily bright and, uh, and co competent fellow. So let me just um, ask you about uh, uh, Bernie Sanders before um, uh, we move on after the break to the Republicans. Uh, not so easy for a losing candidate to have a lasting legacy, to create a movement, to create something that lives beyond. Bernie Sanders is not historically a Democrat. Um, will he stay in the party? Will the party reflect his ideas beyond this election? I know we're in the heat of it right now, so it's difficult to get the perspective, but what do you think? I've been fascinated by Bernie Sanders' success at fundraising. Uh, he has as much money as Hillary Clinton, and while that may not help deliver him a win, what it is, it's a market read of how much embedded support there is out there for what he represents and perhaps for him personally. So after this race is over, he's still going to have access to money and platforms and Saturday Night Live shows. And, you know, I think that Bernie Sanders is very committed, sees himself as finally late in life, having an opportunity he fought for uh, these many years. And I think he's finding a willing audience that wants to hear it and be activated by him, not just in, it'll be more muted. Uh, in the future, but I don't see him going away. And I see a very large pool, particularly of millennials, who are frustrated and think that their options have been uh, uh, much more constrained than their predecessors historically, who are ready to, to march for him and do things for him and continue to kind of keep him in the news. So I don't think, I don't think Bernie Sanders is going away after this, this campaign. Hillary Clinton is going to have the limelight, but Bernie Sanders is going to be a thorn in her side uh, after she wins the election, she probably, in my view, will win the election. But he's not going to, you know, just just be someone. He'll help get her elected, but he's going to be a problem problem for her for a long time. She'll have to wrestle with him. Uh, there's a, a real dilemma for uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, if he, as one of his advisors has suggested, tries to fight all the way to the convention, even after she's won an overwhelming share of delegates and popular votes trying to lure over those super delegates. Something that Sanders has said all along as an illegitimate part of the process, he doesn't look like the man of integrity anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a second factor here. Ralph Nader uh, cost uh, Al Gore the election in 2000. What followed was the Iraq war, huge tax cuts and massive deficits, a Supreme Court uh, that has uh, eviscerated the Voting Rights Act and many other things. That pretty much destroyed Nader as a major force in the progressive world. If Bernie Sanders doesn't comp uh, go all, all out for Hillary Clinton to make sure she's elected, he will be discredited in a lot of places. So he's got some choices to make. He's going to be a national and international celebrity. He, uh, his camp has already suggested that he's not going back to independent status. He'll be a Democrat from this point on. But the question is, does he go back to the Senate as somebody really better liked and with more leverage or as a pariah? Okay, very good. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll come back after the break to talk about the other side of the aisle, the Republicans, in just a moment. Again, our panel includes Steve Clemens. Steve is the Washington editor-at-large for The Atlantic and editor of Atlantic Live. He is also a senior fellow and founder of the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation, a prominent think tank here in Washington. There, he previously served as executive vice president. Steve writes and speaks frequently about the D.C. political scene, foreign policy, and national security issues, as well as global economic policy challenges. Norman Ornstein, 
Norm is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, an election analyst for CBS News, and a contributor to the National Journal and Atlantic Magazine. His current book, being updated because things are looking so wonderfully, is It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. So, speaking of that topic, let me ask you about the Republicans. Uh, the party needs to wrestle forward with whether they go with their front runner uh, or whether they try and jumble things up. And, you know, they go, always go back to the story of Abraham Lincoln, who came in in the Ted Cruz slot in second place in, in the, when, they, when they came in with delegates. And then Abraham Lincoln came out uh, winning that contest, uh, what, 150 years ago. So I think that Trump... Um, the way I feel it is it's going to be very, very hard to wrestle this away from Trump. But there, there's just, a, you know, a dime of a view out there, a dime of perspective that everyone has their own perspective on. We just don't know what will happen. So, Norm, if you could help our viewers who probably have a difficult t enough time understanding things like the Electoral College yeah. and how our system works They're in the like best Donald of times. Right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Could you help them understand a bit how this system works? Um, this is not a government-run convention. This is a, a yes. private system. Can you buy a delegate? Can you? Can, what, 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 what are the rules here? <laughs> in, in fact, you can buy a delegate. Uh, there, there are no rules that suggest that you can't wine and dine delegates to bring them over. This is a party operation. Now, it's a hybrid. Many of the states, the states themselves set up the primary elections or the caucus systems, but often it's done by the party itself. So where we are is for the Republicans, the Republicans and Democrats each have different numbers of delegates and different rules for how they choose them. For the Republicans, 1,237 delegates make up a majority, okay? 24, uh, uh, or just under uh, 2,500 uh, who are there at the uh, convention. Uh, Donald Trump, as we move through to the final contests, which are June the 7th, and includes the biggest prize, California, where they select by a congressional district or county, the winners of those congressional districts or counties win some share of delegates. New Jersey, the last two, that's June the 7th. The convention is July the 18th in Cleveland. Now, if we end up where almost certainly we will, Donald Trump with somewhere in close to 1,200 delegates. He could get over, but somewhere in that range. A lead in the popular votes in all the contests by millions of votes over Ted Cruz and the others. Republicans have two choices. One is you say, and remember that in the polls, 60 to 65% of Republicans say that the nominee should be the one who wins the most delegates and the most votes. You can say, Never mind that. We are going to manipulate this process, go to multiple ballots, and choose somebody else who did not win the most votes. If that happens, Cleveland will look like Chicago in 1968, the Democratic Convention where there were riots and blood in the streets and turmoil on the convention floor. And Donald Trump, who will be out saying, uh, I've had this uh, nomination stolen from me by a corrupt party at a time of populism when most people believe it, he will either run as an independent and take votes away from Republicans or go around the country with his followers saying blow up this corrupt Republican Party. And that has consequences all the way down the line or the more likely outcome. He will get to that point and there, were, there are going to be a couple hundred at least unpledged delegates who could do anything they want who between June and July will say, you know what, better to say Trump's our nominee for better or worse and there's a lot of money out there, the Koch brothers and other billionaires who want to support the party, put that money into winning the House and Senate races, mm -hmm. the last line of defense. I think that uh, logic uh, really says to me that Donald Trump is very likely to be the Republican nominee. I, I should add uh, the one element there is that one of the criticisms of Donald Trump is that he's not taken the delegate process seriously. What's interesting is just this past week, I have received photos uh, from the ground where Donald Trump is now going and having his picture taken with people in rural areas of Indiana. So it's evidence that Donald Trump has actually gotten the message and is shifting his campaign to take these people, oftentimes they're farmers, 
they're, they're not connected, but they take their politics very seriously. But it's a different crowd, it's a different style than Donald Trump has been doing, but he's shifted and he's doing exactly what Norm said, he's going after these, these delegates. One thing that could happen is you could have party bosses decide they don't want either of the two of them, and then the two candidates with 80% of the delegates between them are both being shafted, and you could see a, tru a Trump Cruz alliance. But I think Cruz will take it to the convention and then basically say, I represent the wave of the future, which is the conservative movement. I'm going to turn this party with this election and afterwards into a pure conservative party and try to become the leader of the party anticipating a Trump loss. And frankly, where we're headed on the Republican side is an existential crisis for who is going to control the future of this party. Pragmatic conservatives, populists who have no particular ideology like Trump, or uh, much more ideological, rigid, radical right uh, people like mm -hmm. Cruz. And we don't have the answer to that. Right. Okay, well, gentlemen, that's where we have to leave it for today. Maybe we'll learn more before the next time we get together. Thank you very much Thank for you. joining me on Dachle Washington. Inside Washington at Elhura.com. Ma'akum Robert Satloff. Shukran lakum wa illa lakum.